Happy Easter again. Today's a day of celebration when we remember that Jesus is risen, he's alive, he's conquered death, and that we too one day will rise from the dead when he returns. Now we're gonna look at John's account of the resurrection on that first Easter morning. And as we do so, I want to encourage us to do three things. And we're gonna read this account in two parts. The first bit is John chapter 20, verses one to nine. Let me read it to you. Early on the first day of the week, so it was a Sunday, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene, that's Mary from Magdala on the uh, coast of Galilee, the one whom Jesus had, had set free spiritually, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, that's John who's written this gospel account, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. When I was growing up, my parents were always trying to train me to close the door behind me whenever I left the room or the house. You see, in England, it gets cold in the winter and you need to close the door when you leave a room to try and keep the warmth in. But I was never very good at this. I'd always leave the door open. And as I walked away, my parents would always shout out, Miles, close the door. Were you born in a stable? Now, what strikes me when I read this first part of the passage is that when Mary Magdalene turns up at Jesus's tomb, the tomb is open. Verse one says the stone had been removed from the entrance. The door, as it were, had been left open. Now, although Jesus was literally born in a stable, I don't think this meant that he'd forgotten to close the door when he came out of the tomb. No, he'd left it open on purpose so that so that the the disciples, so that the world, so that you and I could look in and see that he was no longer there because he'd risen from the dead. So today, explore the empty tomb. The empty tomb is the first significant piece of evidence for the resurrection. Now, some have tried to explain this away by saying, well, maybe the disciples stole the body, but this was not the case. Not only do the gospel accounts show us that the disciples were just as shocked as everyone else that Jesus' body wasn't there, but they eventually went around declaring with boldness that Jesus was risen, and all of them were were then executed for their faith in the resurrected Jesus. All of them except for John, who was actually beaten, left for dead, but he survived and then was imprisoned on the island of Patmos. These disciples, they would not have willingly died such gruesome deaths for something that they knew to be untrue if they had stolen the body. They hadn't. Others say that perhaps the Jewish leaders or the Roman authorities had taken the the body. But once Christianity started to grow rapidly, the Jewish and Roman leaders tried to desperately stop the growth of the faith, but they couldn't. If they had the body, they could have just produced it and said, look, he's not risen. But they couldn't because Jesus was alive. Another suggestion has been that perhaps grave robbers stole the body. But this is even less likely because the only thing of value worth stealing from a grave is not the body, but the grave clothes themselves. And verse six and seven tells us that the grave clothes were left behind in the tomb and folded up neatly. The tomb was empty because Jesus had risen. Now, as you consider this evidence, I wonder which of the the disciples do you associate yourself with more? Perhaps you're like John, who ran to the tomb and he got there first, a, a fact which he 
proudly tells us three times in just five verses. John obviously was a bit kiasu. But when he gets there first, he then stops. He hesitates. He, he looks in a bit, but verse seven tells us, but did not go in. Maybe like John, you're a bit hesitant to look too closely. You're a bit nervous to really consider the resurrection because deep down you know that if it is true, it might rock your world. Or maybe you're like Peter, who ran to the tomb and went straight in, no hesitation. Maybe you're really curious and you can't wait to get to know more about this risen Jesus and discover for yourself just who he is. In my last Alpha Small Group online, uh, uh, I had this uh, woman who was uh, uh, a guest in my small group, but at the time her husband had decided mm, maybe it wasn't for him, so he didn't come along. And then uh, just uh, two, three weeks ago, uh, at the end of one of the services at HTBB uh, in Lot 10, uh, she came forward and introduced me to her husband. Uh, it was his first time in HTBB. He loved it. And he said to me, guess what? I'm on the current Alpha course that's happening right now. And I said, wow, that's great news. What, what made you decide to go on that course? And he said, well, actually, I've got a confession to make. Uh, when my wife was in your Alpha online small group, he said, although I said I didn't want to do it, he said, actually, I was a little bit curious. And I'd come into the room away from her laptop, sit in the corner, and I'd listen in to the small group discussion. And he did that, listening in, peering in from a distance in the room every week for the 10 weeks. And at the end, he thought, wow, I want to know more. So he's on this current alpha and loving it. And I thought, that's great. That's a bit like the disciple John, who got there, but kind of wanted to look from a distance. Maybe you're like that, or, or maybe you're like Peter, you just want to be all in. Either way, it doesn't matter because they both end up encountering the risen Jesus. So whichever one you're like today, explore the resurrection. And this leads us to the second part of the story. This is John 20, verses 10 to 18. Let me read it to you. Then the disciples went back to their homes. That's uh, John and Peter. But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you, carried, if you have carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned round towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. If my first encouragement is to explore the empty tomb. My second encouragement to you is this, encounter the risen Jesus. Mary encounters the risen Jesus. And the second piece of evidence for the resurrection was the eyewitness accounts. The risen Jesus was physically seen by over 500 people on 11 different occasions over a six week period. That level of eyewitness account would stand up in any court of law. And the very first person to encounter the risen Jesus was Mary Magdalene. Having seen the empty tomb, Peter and John return home, but Mary stays at the tomb. She can't move. She is gripped and trapped by her grief. The passage makes reference to her crying and weeping four times in just five verses. Today, if you are down 
outcast, if you are sad, if you're full of regret, what ifs or if onlys, Jesus can replace your tears with joy. You can move on with Jesus' help. For Mary, you see, there was this key moment of turning. Verse 14 says, at this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there. Mary had been looking at the tomb, the place of the dead, but then she turns round and sees Jesus. At first, she doesn't recognize him, partly because of her grief, but also because she'd been searching for him, expecting to find a dead body. But now he's here, standing in front of her, alive. Don't look for life amongst the dead. Don't look for life amongst things that can't deliver it. Our ambitions, our career, wealth, possessions, or addictions. Rather, turn from these things and look to the risen Jesus for life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and life in all of its fullness, John 10, 10. And he's calling you today to that fullness of life in him by your name. It's when Jesus simply says to her, Mary, that she recognizes it is the Lord. It's personal. Jesus is calling you by name today. Turn to him for life. I recently uh, heard a couple share their story to me. They, um, they've been living a life that was pretty destructive. Uh, uh, the woman, she was uh, a, a table dancer at a club and the guy was um, a customer that often frequented the club and they, they got to know each other. They started dating and they kind of connected around their lifestyle, which was all about alcohol and drugs. And they sort of went on a downward spiral together. The low point came when the woman said she just felt so depressed and such darkness that one day at their condo, she went out onto the balcony, closed the door behind her, sort of got over and sat on the edge of the balcony. She said there was such darkness engulfing her mind and all she could hear were these voices telling her to jump, to jump, to jump. At that point, her mother turned up. She'd come to visit them in the condo. And to her horror, she saw her daughter right on the edge of the balcony, seeing what she was about to do. The mother didn't know what to do, but for some reason, she just cried out, Jesus. As the woman heard the name of Jesus, she said, it was like this light just pierced the darkness in her mind. The voices went away. And this peace, this warmth, like a pair of arms just engulfed her and she knew it was Jesus. She climbed off the balcony and went back inside, and that was the beginning of her life changing. She started to go to church. Her, her boyfriend went along with her, and they both encountered Jesus and put their faith in him. The guy said the very first thing he suddenly had this overwhelming desire to do was to marry his girlfriend, so he married her. And then bit by bit, God completely put them back together again. And they began to live this new life in Christ, a fullness of life. Jesus has given them life and life in all of its fullness. Turn to him and he will do the same for you. So encounter Jesus, but don't just stop at encounter. When Mary encounters the risen Jesus, it's interesting that he says to her in verse 17, do not hold on to me. You see, there was so much more to come for Mary and the disciples. When I was a student at university, I had to read uh, a novel by the Filipino author, Jose Rizal, which is named after these words of Jesus, Nolimi Tangeri, do not hold on to me. This amazing novel, inspired by these words of Jesus, powered the movement to freedom and independence for the Filipino people. Yes, Jesus wants us to encounter him, but that's just the beginning. Don't stop there. There is so much more freedom to come. 
And that leads on to my third point. Explore the empty tomb, encounter the risen Jesus, but thirdly, enter new creation. The resurrection of Jesus, that first Easter Sunday, changed everything once and for all. Jesus's death on the cross and his resurrection means that death itself has been defeated. It's not the end anymore. One day you will rise from the dead too. But Jesus' resurrection didn't just show that death was defeated. It also began the process of new creation, of recreation, of God making all things new. And when you put your faith in Jesus, St. Paul says that you are a new creation. The old you has gone, buried with Christ. And the new you is here, risen with Christ. You can step out of the tomb of the past today and into the bright dawn of the future. When Mary first turns to see Jesus, we're told in verse 15 that she thinks he was the gardener. Now the writer John here is probably hinting at a double meaning with these words because Jesus wasn't the gardener in a literal sense, but in another sense, He was. You see, just as Adam had been put in the garden of creation by God to tend it and steward it, but ultimately failed. Jesus, as St. Paul calls him, is now the last Adam or the second Adam, the perfect one who is the steward and gardener of new creation. And this means that there's hope. The resurrection of Jesus is a sign amongst all the pain and troubles of this world that something greater is going on, the advance of his kingdom, and that one day when he returns, this process of new creation will be complete. I'm sure over the last few weeks, uh, like me, you've been looking at the news of what's been going on in Ukraine with absolute horror. The, the bombing of innocent civilians, the indiscriminate destruction of Ukrainian cities. But amongst all of that awful news, I saw this photo, a photo of hope. This is a photo of a wedding of a couple recently amongst all the ruins in the city of Kharkiv in the northeast of Ukraine. The rubble and trouble around them looks like the end of the world. But their wedding is a sign, a foretaste that shows that they believe a better future awaits. And likewise, the resurrection points to a future hope beyond the here and now. St. Paul says that all those who put their faith in Jesus, and that includes you if you do that today. All those who put their faith in Jesus are, he says, in Christ. It's a phrase that Paul himself uses no less than 83 times in the New Testament. This means that somehow, mystically, whatever is true of Christ, whatever happened to him, now is somehow also true of us and has happened to us who are in him. This means that you died in Christ, the old you is gone. It means that you rose from the dead in Christ, the new is here, and that you are a steward of new creation also. So today, step out of the tomb in Christ, step out of that which has entombed you or trapped you and step in faith into new creation. And that means you have a role to play. It means that your family life, your work life, your friendships, that, that coffee or tea you have with that friend, even when you wash the plates and the dishes, everything is now infused with meaning and purpose as all things are being made new. And tell others about the risen Jesus. In verse 18, we read this. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that he had said these things to her. The early church called Mary Magdalene the apostle 
to the apostles because she was the very first person in history to tell others that Jesus is alive. And we can do the same. How? Well, you can invite a friend along to church or invite them along to Alpha, or you can share both our Good Friday online service and this online Easter service with a friend. Just copy the link, send it to them on WhatsApp. Just tell your friends. You can play your part in spreading the greatest news of hope humankind has ever heard. And healing is always a sign of the inbreaking of God's kingdom. It's a foretaste of the fullness of new creation that is to come in him. So keep praying for healing. About five to six weeks ago now, uh, at the end of one of the services in church, this young woman came forward. She said, I, I'm, I'm not a Christian. I'm from a, a Taoist family, but she'd been brought along by a Christian friend and they'd sort of encouraged her to come forward to be prayed for. And she shared how she had sort of digestive issues, intestinal problems, was always in pain whenever she ate and she was on medication along with the side effects. So we prayed for her. We commanded the condition to leave her body in the name of Jesus. And then we asked for the peace of God to come and rest upon her and for her to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, just uh, last week, at the, again, at the end of the Sunday service, the same woman came running towards me. Her eyes were sparkling. She was grinning from ear to ear. And she said, guess what? Guess what? Ever since we prayed, she said, the pain has gone. Jesus has healed me. I'm off my medication. It's amazing. And of course, I've now put my faith in Jesus. I follow him. And she was bold. Just that week, her mother had uh, tested positive for COVID. And this daughter, this woman had plucked up the courage to go and say to her mum, said, well, mum, can I pray for you? The mum said, okay. And she prayed for her mum in Jesus' name that the mum would have no symptoms. And she said, it's great. She said, my mum's got no symptoms. And she's now saying, who is this Jesus in whose name you're praying for me? So today, step out of the tomb and into new creation. The Lord has got great things lined up for you. So why don't we pray right now? Wherever you are watching this, you might just want to open the door of your heart. Open your hands as a sign to say, Lord, I am open. Just allow this prayer to be that moment of turning for you from life to death. Just say, thank you, Jesus, that you died for me and you rose from the dead for me, that I can be forgiven and have life everlasting and life in all of its fullness in you. I turn now from the things that do not bring life, the things that are wrong that I've said and done and thought. And I turn to you, Jesus, in faith. Please, would you step into my heart now by your Holy Spirit and live within me forever. Thank you that today is the start of the rest of eternity with you. And if you want to know that fullness of life, if you want freedom from anything right now, or maybe you want healing in the name of Jesus, I just pray for you. Lord, come. Would you bring your freedom? Would you bring your fullness? And would you bring your healing power? We command sickness to leave the body right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're now going to share informal communion together. We're going to remember that on that first Easter, Jesus died and rose from the dead for you and for me. So if you've got any bread or wafers and juice, you might want to grab it. And if not, don't worry, I'm doing this for you. 
St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11 that on the same night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he, he took the cup, he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's say together now the words of the Lord's Prayer that'll come up on the screen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So you might want to take some bread or wafer. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ given for you. And the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ keep you in eternal life. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for feeding us spiritually. Thank you that you died for us and you rose to new life for us. Thank you that we rise to new life in you too and that hope is now eternally ours in you, Jesus. We worship you now. Let's worship.